Great sales people or sales leaders get really comfortable with my role in this engagement looks like this. Your role is to be a trusted advisor and solution. The analogy that I always think about is a good salesperson, to your point, is almost like a conductor of an orchestra, right? Like that, that, that bringing in the violin at the right time and bringing in the drum and it's, yeah. they're orchestrating the way this is going to unfold for the customer. Welcome to Growth Pulse, the B2B sales podcast. You might be a salesperson. You could lead a sales team. Maybe you run a business or you're a battle-tested entrepreneur. Then we built this podcast for you. Great salespeople are built, not born. We learn so much from the deals we win, but we learn even more from the deals we lose. In each episode, we bring you some of the world's leading salespeople, sales leaders, and experts in sales tech to share their best lessons from both their wins and their losses. Before we start, please check out the screen of your phone or laptop, and if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you've clicked subscribe and press that like button down below. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple, hit the plus sign to follow so we can let you know when we publish each new episode. If you like the episode, drop us a comment with any questions about the show. We'd love to get to know our audience. Great businesses always feature world-class salespeople and the best salespeople are always learning. So let's jump in. Welcome back to another episode of Growth Pulse, the B2B sales podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Dan Bartels, here as always with my great co-host, Simon Peterson. Mate, welcome back. Thanks, buddy. I'm excited to be here. I've got two Dans on the on the podcast today. It'll be interesting. Mate, two, two Dans, absolutely two Dans. We've been hunting down our great friend, Dan Bogner, for a, a number of weeks now and just I'm overwhelmed to have, have you on the show, mate. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you. I was just thinking, Dan, actually, it's not just two Dan, Simon, it's two Dan B's on the call as well. It's yeah, we're, we're, we're going to make this challenging for you. Excellent. <laughs> so for everyone who hasn't met you before, Dan, look, we've all worked together for, for many years and I, both as colleagues, competitors, but in different environments. I want to make sure I give your resume that it's due credit, but you've spent time at Salesforce, at DocuSign, you're now at HubSpot, but give us the 10 cent tour of kind of the tour of Dan, because you've done a whole heap of stuff in a bunch of different roles. And, and one of those areas we want to delve into today, but like, give us the tour. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity, Simon, Dan. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I feel, feel a bit tired and old listening to your description of me, but yeah, look, I've had a varied background. What I would say is I started off my career in consulting at PwC, which I did for about 10 years. And then if I age myself for a second, the dot-com boom was happening in the early 2000s. And so I jumped ship and joined this startup company called Siebel, which was one of the pioneers of CRM and spent 10 years at Siebel. And then we got acquired by Oracle and then 10 years at Salesforce post that in between a couple of years in the States at, a, at a, an AI startup and DocuSign for a few years. And, and now I just turned over my first anniversary at HubSpot. So yeah, it's been a long career. Mate, that's a lot of very exciting businesses that have grown very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, look, I, I feel really fortunate as I've reflected on my career. I've, I've had the opportunity to work with a number of incredible technologies, some incredible leaders, been inspired by the teams and people I've worked with. So yeah, I'm, I'm feeling very grateful and appreciative of, of everything that's happened over uh, my career. Now, I know part of what we wanted to talk about today, which is a little bit of a, a different topic to what yeah. we've, we focus on across many of the episodes of the podcast. In my early experience and exposure to yourself was at Salesforce and you were at the time leading, I think we we're heading up the SE, the solution That's engineering right. team at Salesforce at the time. And it was definitely a piece for me as a junior salesperson, learning how to understand A, what is solution engineering? Mm. And, and it's a technical sale piece for those who aren't in software and that's a different But really how to understand how to use that, that, that tool within the organization, within your deals, and it really is a, a skill in itself to yes. really work with that colleague and, and work well. So just for the benefit of everybody, do you want to give everyone, the, the listeners a bit of an overview of what is an SE? What's that solution engineering piece? And, and how do you guys think about a sale yeah, process? Sure. Happy to, Dan. Look, it's, a, it's an interesting question you've asked because I think that if we're honest with each other, no one really grows up wanting to be an SE, right? You don't know about it. There's no university course to go on where you can leave with a credential yeah. to be an SE. Mm -hmm. And... As I reflect upon my own career, I, I'll be honest and say I fell into it almost by chance. My first SE job was actually at Siebel Systems back in the day, and I had no idea what an SE role 
liked it. It was only once I got into it that I realized, wow, this is actually an incredible job and probably one of the best kept secrets in the IT industry because you get to work on some really complex challenges. You get to partner with a sales organization. You're largely customer facing and you get to be really creative when it comes to solutioning what it is the customer ends up buying. So yeah. it's almost in some respects, a, almost like a consulting type role. The difference is you're not there to deliver projects. You're there really to understand what the customer's pain is and then attribute your solution and the value from your solution to that pain. Some companies call it sales consulting, solution consulting, solution engineering, pre-sales, but that's really the discipline. And ultimately what you're there to do is the job of an SE is to get to a point in the sales cycle where vendor of choice has been identified. And then generally speaking at that point, the SE kind of disengages and the sales process continues through to negotiate and close the deal. So Dan, my experience with solution engineers is different com companies have different cultures. And I think I, I left big German ERP company, one way of doing solution engineering. And I, I moved into Salesforce. What was quite different to me was the power of the SEs and what they were given in the sales cycle. Yes. So very early in a deal, there was an assessment. Are we a good technical fit? Is it a go, no go from a, is our technology actually going to solve the problem? Very different for me from what I was used to many years ago in the nineties. How's the SE role in your career evolved? Cause I mentioned it's quite different today than it was when you first started in that role. Yeah. At yeah. Look, I think that's true, Simon. Maybe if I just share with you my own thoughts of it, uh, I, I remember when I started in the SC world, one of the things that frustrated me was we were perceived as the demo dollies uh, to mm. use that expression, right? Like we were, when, when a salesperson wanted a demo, they'd reach out to their trusty SC and the SE would come in and they'd do some magic around the keyboard and, and then they'd disengage. And when I became an SE, maybe because of my consulting background or, or what have you, I just thought, I thought there's much more that the SE could bring to the table than just being the demo guy. The demo is important. Absolutely. Mm but it's not the be all and end all. And so when I started leading SE teams, I, I'm not your classic SE leader insofar as I'm not particularly technical. I can fake it if you like, and I, I can have an exec level conversation where I can talk about the value of technology, but I'm, I'm not a deep technical person, but I always felt that if an SE navigated in the right way, and if they viewed themselves as a partner of the sales organization, rather than a service provider to the sales organization, then we could have a very different conversation. And, and if I explain what I mean, I think if an SE sees themselves as a service provider, then they're really passive, they're reactive. They wait for the salesperson to come in and say, okay, we've got a demo next Tuesday. And then the SE asks a bunch of questions to try and understand what the heck they should be demoing. Somebody that views themselves as a partner is somebody that is going to front a customer call with the salesperson. They're going to be very proactive. They're going to hopefully own some relationships in the account that is independent of the salesperson. They're going to be thinking about how do I attribute business value to what it is we're selling. And the demo is really at the end of the day, just one step in the process. And it's really just, I always think of it as like a piece of theater that we do just to be able to show that this thing exists and it's real and you can touch it and feel it. But what the SE does and, and the way they engage, if they're truly a partner, it's just a different proposition. And so. When I was able to lead SE teams at Salesforce, that was the approach we took. We said right from the get-go, we're not, we're not the demo guys, we're the partner of the sales organization. And so that changed how we engaged. It, it changed a lot around our brand inside the company. And I, 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 it was definitely a, a big transition for a lot of the SEs to go through. But an exciting one, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It was exciting. It was scary for a lot of people, like if I'm honest, because I think that there were certainly a bunch of SEs that were just comfortable acting in that mode of when you want something, you come and grab me and I'll deliver it to you. And, and so we were asking them to do things that up until that point was quite unnatural for them. And so we really had to invest a lot in enablement and just resetting expectations. And we brought a lot of um, talent in from the outside for that reason to try and reset the bar. Yeah. Um, but we were just able to have a very different relationship with a sales organization because of that. Yeah, that's, that's outstanding. And I think it's interesting in every sales cycle, there's one word that occurs to me when I think of SEs and successful sales cycles, and that's trust. Yeah. One, one of the things that 
I often see in sales cycles is regardless of how good the salesperson in is, it's difficult for them to really build genuine trust with yes. some, some of their prospects. And, and you engage with a really good SE and they're very much focused on the outcome and the problem that we're trying to solve with our technology. They build trust. It's an incredible thing to see when an SE is on their game, building trust with the prospect. Yes. Everything is possible once that happens. I, I, I guess you see that. Every yeah. Day. Look, yeah, absolutely. It's a really strange thing, Simon, that you touched on because I came out of consulting. I spent 10 years at PwC and you would walk into a room and you would just say you were from PwC and there was just implicit trust that you knew what you were doing. And that mm -hmm. brand translated into, I trust what you say to me. I trust the advice you're giving to mm -hmm. me. When I switched from a consultant to being on the vendor side, that trust went away immediately. It was like, now I was a software vendor. Uh, yep. And Dirty then sales guy. Yeah, correct. Yeah. And so nothing changed. I was still the same person. It's just the way mm. in which I was perceived changed. Mm. Then you have this other challenge, which you spoke about, which is once you in sales and now being in sales, I've noticed that different again, which is when you're a salesperson, you're perceived by the customer as not having their best interest in mind necessarily. You're viewed as I'm there to close a deal and I'm there to earn mm -hmm. commission on the sale. And, but the SC is the one person in that relationship that can, can get away with the fact that yes, they're there ultimately to sell something, but they're perceived as independent in, mm -hmm. in yeah, because they're not commissioned the same way that they, they don't have sales in their title. And so the SC is in this really unique position that when they say something, the customer does listen. And mm -hmm. it can almost be verbatim, the same thing that the salesperson says, but it just has a different element of trust associated with it. So I, I agree with you, Simon. I think if the SE is smart about how they uh, position themselves, that trust can really be leveraged very heavily. And that's part of the reason, Simon, why it was so important for me when I managed SE teams that I wanted SEs owning relationships, mm -hmm. right? I wanted them to align themselves to the head of architecture or the head of technology uh, because it, they can play a really influential role uh, in a way that a salesperson can't necessarily. Yep. Totally agree. Dan, I, 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 I remember learning um, a, a lot of that process, whether directly from you or from different sort of people in your team mm. about how to really leverage. Okay. It's very rare in a B2B model that you're just selling to a singular person. Yes. Their sign up has got multiple people, their decision-making process has got multiple people, even just everyone getting okay for the investment of time and effort to talk to you has multiple influences on, should you even be worrying about this as a priority and your list of stuff to do? Yes. And then leveraging that SE relationship, you got to say, hey, listen, this is a person who is not quoted on closing this deal. There's <laughs> never that perception yeah. of the fact that this person is fundamentally getting paid to sell me something. And so then actually pairing up the right person, finding that right individual, yes. and it may not always be the right, the title you think it would be. But finding that person who is the, who's the technical owner or the, often that's, technical is the wrong term, actually. Yes. The solution owner, who actually really understands this problem on the business side. And, and one of the things that I did learn in that process, though, was, and I use this, and, and we talk about this on the podcast all the time, is focus on the problem you're trying to solve, not the technology, not the widget you think you've got in your, in your bag to solve. And it's that the ability for an SC to actually bring out that conversation, but sometimes to educate the customer on how to even think about the problem in the first place. Because often they've come to you with, hey, listen, I, I want to buy a CRM or I want to yes. buy an ERP or I want to buy a, some FX. And okay, but that's not the problem you've got. Yes. The problem you've got looks like this. Huh. Why do you think an SE, other than what we've just spoken about, being yes. the fact they're not quoted, what, what's in their approach that allows them to have a different conversation yeah. with the customer than what typically most salespeople have? Yeah. Look, it's so interesting, Dan, because listening to you, I was thinking the, the, the crazy reality or dirty secret of this industry is the SEs are absolutely paid on the same as the salesperson. They, are. They, they, they don't earn commission in the same way. Like, like they're typically bonused rather than commission, but absolutely their success is tied to the sales success. So you're absolutely right. I think the difference is in the approach. Like the SE is, is positioned as the expert between the customer and the salesperson. So, so their job is like I, as an SE, you know, the product intimately. Mm -hmm. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to identify pain on the customer side. 
And you're absolutely right that sometimes what a customer feels that pain is actually not a pain. It's a, it might be a symptom, uh, but the cause of the pain is something else. And so what the SE is really good at is continuing to dig in with the customer through a, a discovery process to really uncover what are the different types of pain, who owns that pain, who really feels the consequence of that pain. And if they do it well, then what they do is to the, almost to the point you were making, they're able to influence the buyer in a way that they uncover pain that the buyer not, doesn't necessarily know they had before. Mm -hmm. Competitively, what they can also do is if they shift the emphasis to, to like almost like adjacent areas of pain, they can broaden the scope of a deal. And then the other side of it is they can start to create a narrative for different stakeholders in the deal. The narrative to the technical buyer is going to be different to the business buyer and so forth. And so I think SEs, we generally train them to be very consultative in the way they engage. The, and that consultative approach is uh, through various frameworks and so forth is really designed to, to help map what are we hearing from the customer against the solution capabilities and, and how do we broaden that to the extent possible? Absolutely. So I've got a question here for the three of us, actually, because sure. we're all now sales leaders and we'll, and we'll lead you to talking for, give everyone a preface about the difference between SEs and sales. But I think there are also some cardinal sins here that salespeople commit on a regular basis. Yes. When either bringing SEs in or engaging with SEs. And I want to pause <laughs> you know, three sales heads now <laughs> and give some tips for, for our listeners around how, how to not engage with an SE. Or if you engage this way, you will get a bad outcome. Yeah. I think that's some really good lessons. Yeah. I reckon you've got two great stories. It's so funny, Dan, because in my role as an SE leader, I would always be in the sales forecast. And I was yeah. always, I was always the guy, I was the pain in, in, in the room asking these really tough questions about how well qualified is this? And did we really know the decision process? And is that decision maker really the decision maker? And have we triangulated it? And so it's really easy to ask all those questions on the SE side. When you become on the sales side, you realize, geez, I must've been such a bloody pain because <laughs> like, that's the stuff that as a salesperson, you're desperately trying to, to find out. And yeah. mate, it's obvious, like I get it, SE, but it's hard. So look, it's a funny world, but I think the answer to your question is an SE doesn't want to be the doom in the room. So they don't, I, I would say SEs are naturally half glass empty kind of guys is my yeah. view. I think if we weren't, we'd probably be sales leaders uh, or salespeople. I think it's that innate nature of an SE's personality, which is that they tend to be half glass empty. They tend to focus on the things that are missing. They're not there to just to like attribute blame, but what they're, what they're trying to do is to say, look, there are these elements that are missing, right? Mm -hmm. And, and we need to get a plan to be able to resolve it. But I know that, that what an SE always hates is. Uh, and it happens all the time is a, 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 a salesperson that says, look, I've just done discovery with a customer. They want a demo next week of sales hub. I've locked it in for Wednesday at two o'clock. Can you be ready? And the SE sitting there and go, hang on, what do you mean you've done discovery? I know I haven't asked any questions. Well, what do you want me to show them? Oh, don't mm -hmm. worry. You don't need to do discovery here. I've done it all. And here are the pain Here's points. The notes. Here's the notes. Just yeah. go and knock up a demo. Yeah. And it's like the SE is going, hang on, you, you've just missed a real opportunity for me to sell that credibility and build that trust that we talked about earlier. So 100%. yeah, that's, def that's definitely a pain point, but it's so funny because I notice as a sales leader, I now do that to the SEs and Oops. everything goes around full circle. <laughs> I think on that point, Dan, and I, this is a piece that I've lent on in, in leading teams over the last kind of 10 years for myself, even if you used to be an SE. And even if the notes you've got, you recorded the session, I don't yep. know, you stuck it through chat GPT and it's got the best structured notes ever on the face of the planet. That process of having an SE in the room or having that session is not for you as the salesperson and it's not for the SE. Yes. For the customer. For the customer, hundred percent. And it's an, even if all you end up doing is a replay of the first call process. Yes. And the same pain points are brought up in the same meeting. If you structure it well, the customer never walks out of that with, hold on, I've told you all this information. Yes. How did you not get it out of the first call? And that's a bit of a, that's a bit of a catch all for the SEs as well, right? Walk in. Okay. If that meeting's already happened, read the freaking notes, e. walk, walk in and say to the customer, I've read your notes. Here's the bullet points, but do you mind if we, re we, re we re revisit those? Cause I've got some different ways I want to go to the yes. process. It's so the customer walks out feeling like. I've interrogated this problem properly. 
Yes. I've pulled this problem apart and it's not about me buying whatever widget you're selling. It's about, I've got a problem I want to solve and you guys are here to help me solve the problem. Yeah. That's the pro that's the process. Yeah. yeah. And when you do that, this process working between a, a salesperson and an SE becomes this match made in heaven. Yeah. Completely agreed. I think generally what I would say, and I know it's a generalization, but generally customers want to feel heard. They want to feel understood. They don't always have the answers. Like they want to know about other customers that have faced similar challenges to them. They, they want to know about what does best practice look like. They want to know the stories and tribulations from customers and the learning other customers have had. And that's the thing that I think the SE brings. And so in the conversation, you're absolutely right. Like a salesperson and SE, even listening to the answer that the customer gives, they'll interpret things slightly differently. And they'll ask qualifying questions based on their level of expertise. And so the conversation can go down multiple paths, but I think you're right for the customer. It's the benefit of you've explored my pain. You've understood me. You've heard what I've had to say. You've got my interests in mind and that's really powerful. Yeah. And then I think that the, the next step often doesn't be, end up becoming, let's come back and demo or show you the product no. or whatever it may be. There's a whole bunch of steps between, okay, how do we solve it? How do we, what's, what are we actually dealing with here? What's yes. the real problem? What's the diagnosis? And quite often it's one of the best deals I've done. You almost get to the end and they go, have we, have we seen the product? Yeah. Have we seen the demo? It's a <laughs> funny thing, isn't it? <laughs> it's really funny because I, I would say that to the SEs a lot and they would look at me like I was uh, from another world, but I, I would say to them, you should look for ways to not do a demo, right? Like yeah. we don't have to do a demo. You can sell on value, you can sell on references, you can sell on best practices, you can do a range of things. Like the demo at the end of the day is just a proof point. That's all it is. It's yep. I've heard you, I've got this capability, here's what it is. But you're absolutely right. You don't need to do it. But I think that one of the mistakes that, that a lot of us have made in our past is rushing to demo too soon. And I think the mistake if you do that is it's almost the, the opposite of everything we've just been talking about, which is you come across as generic. You haven't understood the customer. You don't really understand their pain. So it's almost, there was this very famous Bob Dylan film clip back in the days where he's standing there and he's got these cardboard signs and he's just showing one word after another. It's almost like yeah. that. It's look, I've got this feature. Is it you interested? No. Okay. I've got another one. Is, and the next one. is yeah. you interested in that? Oh, okay. <laughs> I've got this other one because you just don't know what the customer's lens is. And so I think the mistake is rushing too early. I, I think it's far better to take a little longer, really dig in and understand the customer, um, build that trust. And then when you do come back and demo, you're showing something that, that highlights that you've really understood them and mm -hmm. you're showing them just a snippet of what their world is going to look like in the future. Yep. Yeah. You've seen thousands of demos, engagements with salespeople, SEs over time. What are some of your, your top tips and how to work through this relationship? Um, look, I think the number one thing I think between an SE and a salesperson is mutual respect. If there's a mutual respect for the role you have in the deal, magic happens. If you, you we've all met the AE that thinks he or she is God's gift to the world and the best salesperson and they treat everybody yeah. on their team like servants that need to come in and demo next week, that rapport isn't there. Customers smell that a mile away. You don't build trust. So... I think the best salespeople allow SEs to go and do their job and they don't have to be the smartest person in the room. They don't have to say all of the things during those initial discovery meetings. And that, the, the crux of that is mutual trust and respect. And I think if you've got an SE that you genuinely respect in a sales engagement, you don't have to speak over the top of them. You don't have to tell your prospect that you're just as smart as the SE. So I think that's, you, you build it based on that sort of mutual respect. And I think allow the SE to go do their job. I, I've met some awesome SEs over my time and you know, the best ones are genuinely curious. They love the technology. They're constantly pushing the boundaries of what's possible with whatever technology you're trying to sell. Allow them to go create that magic and that excitement with the prospect. And I think the flip side of that, to your point, Dan, is the thing that used to drive me absolutely nuts about the SEs was the ones that used to in interrogate me on, is there a budget? Is there a need? Is there authority? <laughs> is there timing? I go, dude, that's my job. Yeah. Let me do my job. I'll let you job. So that, to answer your question, Dan Bartels, it's mutual respect. Allow the SE to go do their job and trust them to be 
bloody good at what they do, but the flip side also works. And I've had some fascinating blow-ups in sales teams. And, and most of the time when there's angst between an SE and an AE, it's, it's typically when one or the other started to encroach on the other's role and what they're good at. I, I've had an SE basically run a forecast with an AE and it drives them absolutely nuts. Did, are, are you sure they've got the need, authority and timing? And, and the flip side is an AE saying on a Friday afternoon, mate, I've just done the discovery call. I've booked us in for a demo on Monday. That's a lack of respect because you're not yeah. going to do your best job. So I think mutual respect for me is yeah. a big one. But it, it's an interesting one because I look back at my own career and like you, Dan, I spent 10 years in consulting and I started working with some awesome salespeople. And I used to get brought into deals with, you probably know these people, Paul Appleby and mm -hmm. or Ian Hodge and some of the others, yes. great salespeople in the mid to late nineties. And I loved working with those guys because they actually respected my understanding and knowledge of where the customer wanted to go. And that's how I got into the SE world, basically yes. through just loving showing how I could solve a problem for their prospects. And as a result, yep. those two individuals loved my work and we got on really well, mutual respect, etc. It was when I think Ian Hodge bought me a carton of beer to say thank you for my help on one of the deals. I went, there's probably more to this. I probably need mm. to move into sales and actually get paid to do this. So I guess right. an interesting segue. I, we, I see some brilliant SEs and they look across the, the fence and they see what they perceive is the, the salespeople making all the money, doing all the lovely dinners and lunches, et cetera. Yes. I want to go do that job. It's interesting. And, and I know your career has followed an interesting journey. What do you see as some of the, the best and worst of solution engineers that are at the top of their game, they look across the fence and I want to be a sales guy. That's easier. Yeah. I think that, that goes back to what you were saying, Simon, around the word mutual in, in mutual respect, because mm -hmm. I, I've just as much seen the other side of this, which is the SE that looks at the sales guy and go, mate, you've got the easiest job. You wine and dine some people, you negotiate some pricing. I'm the one doing all the work because I'm doing the discovery and the solutioning and the demo. What are you doing? You're arranging the meeting and bringing the coffee. And I think in those relationships, that's where we butt heads. And so it does have to cut both ways, that, that respect. I absolutely agree. I think the reality though, for many SEs, and, and I even struggled with this myself when I was thinking of making the transition is as an SC, you actually don't carry a lot of risk, right? Because generally speaking, like when you look at an SE's compliant rather, the, their OTE is largely base heavy and the variable portion of it or the at risk portion of it is generally a pretty small percentage. And as we talked about earlier, it's a bonus based on how the team performs. So the at risk element of it for me as an individual is actually really small. When you flip across onto the sales side, you're generally on a 50-50 or a 60-40 plan and success is now up to you, right? It's You're in the driver's seat, but you carry the risk. And, and mm -hmm. I think for a lot of SEs, it's that reality of moving from one comp plan to another is the thing that scares them because they don't carry the risk today. SEs, good SEs get paid really well. And if I'm going to move across into sales, chances are even though my ITE might be the same, my, my base salary goes down and my at-risk component goes up. So it, it's a mm -hmm. tough decision for a lot of SEs. I think the other side of it is you also don't know as an SE how you're going to feel carrying quota. And that's a really big thing to think about because as an SE, you, have, you don't carry it in the same way as a salesperson. As a salesperson, you carry the number. When things are tough, you feel that. And as an SC, you, you don't carry it in the same way. And the thing that's hard to predict as an SC is how are you going to feel in that moment when you're sitting on the other side of the table and now the reality of my quota and having to hit a number every month or every quarter. And so for many SCs, that can be really scary. And yeah, look, it's a tough one. I think that SCs will reach a point in their career where they start to have to make some decisions. It's either they specialize in the SC realm that they're in and they go into architecture or industry specialization, or they go into leadership, or the reality is they will go into sales. And I actually encourage SEs to go into sales because I think the, the good salespeople are the ones that have been in both worlds and they have that appreciation for both. They have the mutual respect for both. And I think I've seen many SEs that have gone on to have incredibly successful sales careers because of that curiosity and customer understanding that we talked about earlier. Absolutely. 
I was going to say, I'm in SE, I've been in the role for five, six, seven years, I'm successful. And I look to myself and I say, look, I want to go be a salesperson. I've observed what they do. I'm prepared to take the risk. What are some of the things that you need to leave behind when you leave the SE ranks? The fact that you're no longer the expert Mm -hmm. and you shouldn't be the expert. And the fact that what that you don't have to be the guy or the, or, or that smart person in the room that's advising and driving. And it's almost like you have to accept that just changing titles is going to mean that the level of trust you have is going to be eroded. It's mm-hmm. just the nature of it. And you have to feel comfortable with that. And it's not easy, but you have to go into it knowing that's going to happen. I think, I, I think though, it's important to have the right sort of career and coaching conversations with people to, to make sure that you really understand their motivation for wanting to go into sales because it can't just be about the money. There has mm-hmm. to be something more to it and you have to feel challenged and motivated to want to take on that responsibility. I know that uh, even in my own career, like there were many times I thought about it and just felt I just wasn't ready for it. I wasn't sure how I would react to carrying the quota. I wasn't sure how I'd react to the change in comp. But I, I think I was really lucky. So if I share a, a kind of a, a vulnerable story with you, I, my last role at, at Salesforce, I actually transitioned out of the SE world and went into uh, operations. So I had an, op- an, an operational role. And the reason I, I chose to do that is ultimately, I always felt that at some point I wanted to be an MD of a software company uh, at a regional level. And so what was interesting in my conversations with anyone I spoke to was like, Dan, no one is going to take you seriously unless you've carried a bag. That was what I heard all the time. And I was like, what do you mean carry a bag? Ultimately, like if you're going to be an MD, you need to have run the sales team and carried a bag means you carry a quota. And that was a really tough lesson. And I think it is, I think it still is true today, by the way. I think that for most MD roles in this industry, we value sales acumen. We value uh, people that carry quota. I was really if I tell a kind of the vulnerable side of the story. So after 10 years at Salesforce, I was made redundant and it was a really tough pill to swallow because I was pretty senior in the company. I'd given everything to the company and all of a sudden I was redundant. And I remember the head of HR at the time, as we were having the conversation, she said to me, Dan, you, you, you don't feel it now, but I promise you, this will be the best thing for your career. And I, I just didn't get what she was saying at that time at all. But I was really lucky because as I started interviewing with people uh, and different companies, what I realized is, let's say I spoke to 10 companies, seven of the 10 looked at my resume and said, look, as impressive as it is, you've never carried a bag and therefore we would just never look at you as a sales leader or, or as an MD. But three of the 10 said, you know what? I've got so many salespeople in my organization. I've got so many AVPs and RVPs. I actually don't need another salesperson. What I need is somebody that can help me build strategy, that can help us think about direct and indirect sales motions. What I need is somebody that can align the various parts of the organization together between Mm. sales, pre-sales, success, marketing. And so I was really fortunate, and particularly with DocuSign when I started, which was the people I was interviewing with valued me not because of my sales background, but because of everything else that I had in my kit bag. And that really allowed me to make that transition. Um, But I think it's rare would be my point. I think nine times out of 10, or in my case, seven out of 10, it's you got to have carried a bag before. Wise words. I I know we've had this conversation before, actually. Last time the three of us were together up in Cairns, we've had this conversation before. And I think it's a really interesting viewpoint of what is, what's critical in that role of being a salesperson or a sales leader that I think then differentiates you between the supporting team, then no, no less important yes. than you are on a team or on an account. Yeah. And what, and then as a result, what are the roles that everyone fulfills? So back to the question Simon asked a moment ago around what's the different skill sets of that approach to your transitioning from being an SE to being, a, being an AE or, or carrying a bag. It is that accountability of a finding the customer. Yes. Because we're going to have the conversation in the first place. That's hard. That's a whole process that if you're an SE, you probably haven't experienced You've that. never had to do. Yep. You've never had to do it, right? Yep. And uh, but why would everyone want to talk to me about this great product that we've got? It solves all these things and look at all the lists of features and stuff. Hold on. But that's a conversation for later. It's how do you deal with that, that process of knocking on doors, making the yep. phone calls, developing the relationships, building credibility without a whole bunch of 
knowledge and conversations. Yes. And yes. That piece is critical as a salesperson. And then being able to step in assign roles. And great sales people or sales leaders get really comfortable with my role in this engagement looks like this. Your role is to be the trusted advisor and solution. My boss's role yes. is to, when I need you to come in and talk to this guy and your conversation can only go this far and I want you to step out there. Yes. And why? Because we're not closing yet. We're just establishing relationship. And then we're going to do all these, make, assign those roles and get really clear as to what it is. And that's the strategy that I think SEs are great at. And I think every SE has the capacity to do yes. this if they can accept that risk. And you're right. The 50-50 split or 60-40 on your package, it's hard. It's hard. Anyone, it's a real, but hey, with great, with that difficulty comes great reward yeah. and that's the, so you get the upside exactly. too, right? Exactly. Uh, but I think the point you've touched on, Dan, is so important because the analogy that I always think about is a good salesperson, to your point, is almost like a conductor of an orchestra, right? Like that, that, that bringing in the violin at the right time and bringing in the drum and well, it's, yeah. they're orchestrating the way this is going to unfold for the customer. And a good salesperson knows that they don't have to be in the limelight. If you think about a conductor, sometimes you don't even see the conductor. Mm. It's got back to the audience. No one really cares. But the magic of it happens in the way in which everyone plays their instrument in time. And I think the good salespeople are the ones that know that's the secret. And what they're good at is understanding who are the individuals that I can count on at the right time and when do I bring them in? And what is it that they're going to do that's going to advance the sale? without me being front and center of it. And so you've got to, you've almost got to leave your ego at the door to a, to a large extent, because as a conductor, it's not about you. It's about the musicians and, and the team that you're working with. I couldn't agree more with that. Yeah. And it's, so, it's an interesting one. I mean, it's about the, it's about the music that you make really. And yeah, yeah. if the audience loves the music, you're doing a great job. It's an interesting one. So we've seen solution engineers or SEs move into yeah. sales roles and to be honest with you, in, in my career, I've seen it work and I've seen it fall over spectacularly. Um, it's an interesting one. I tend to, when it's not working, I've seen one of two reactions. I've seen the sales leader go, they should never have moved into the yes. sales role and write them off. The successful or the better sales leaders, when you sponsor an SE moving and changing roles and, hey, you've got to think about prospecting. You've got mm -hmm. to carry a bag, you own the risk, et cetera. There's a lot of support that's necessary for yes. somebody making that career transition. And, and where I've seen that support lacking, failure often follows, yes. where a, a leader genuinely leans in and says, do you know what? You're not going to get this right first time, but I see your potential. I'm going to help you and I'm going to coach you. T tell me a little bit about that, Dan. I think what, what's yeah. best practice in terms of what you've seen moving into that sales role? Yeah, look, I think you're right, Simon. I think I think you do have to help somebody make that transition. You know, the the thing I, I I think about a lot in the sales role, and I think it's partly why salespeople are successful, is because a couple of things happen. One is you have to feel comfortable that you're going to hear no more than you hear yes, mm -hmm. right? Like you really do. And I think it goes to your point, Dan, which is I'm going to make a bunch of outbound calls here, and most of the time I'm going to get rejected, and that's okay. But if you're not comfortable with that, and if you, if as an SE, you've never experienced that, that can be really unsettling to people because they're just, they're used to people relying on the information they're giving them. And all of a sudden, no one wants to talk to you. So helping people deal with that rejection, I think is important. The other thing is you've got to, you've got to help that, that individual understand that th their role has shifted now. They're no longer the expert. They're no longer the, the center of it. They are the conductor of it. And it's a different set of skills. I, I think the, and, and then the other side of it is as you get closer to the, the close stage of a deal is now you've got to understand the contracts, you've got to understand legality, you've got to understand negotiation. You've, these are all things that an SE hasn't necessarily been exposed to before. There's a lot of assistance I think uh, an SE needs to make that transition. Having said that, I think the more mature SEs, if they've gone about their role the right way, then they hopefully you've already been exposed to a bunch of these things anyway, because they've been partnering with the salesperson already on a proactive basis and mm -hmm. shared some of that risk. But to the point that you're making, I absolutely agree. I think you, you, you've got to make space for the support that individual is going to need, the coaching they're going to need, the role-playing assistance they're going to need, and just that psychological support of, yeah, I get it. It's been a tough day. You've been rejected a bunch of times, but we're going to, we're, we're going to keep going. Here's all the opportunity. Let's keep going.
Absolutely. I think I, I want to give a tip here for anyone listening going, okay, yep, yeah, but how do I, I'm an SC and I think I want to be in sales and what do I do from here? And I reckon I've had this conversation with five or six SEs in my career. And the bit they miss is that, that self-starting yes. aspect of a salesperson. And I do this the same as if I get a, if I get a referral from someone that says, Hey, listen, I want to, I, I want to join your business or I might be a good, I've got a person who I think I want to refer across to them. My answer that is always great. Share my phone number, share my email. I'm not phoning that. Yes. If they can't have the nows to make that first outreach or I've seen a role. I'm going to find you on LinkedIn or I'll, I'll connect or I'll text you and I will organize that engagement. Same as if it's an internal, it doesn't matter if it's internal or not. If you can't prove it, you can't sell yourself in the first instance. I agree. You're not going to be able to make that transition. You're not cut out for us. Person, right. Yeah. And that's Sorry. okay. And, and it's perfectly yep. okay. You can have a great career and we'll support you. But if you can't, so if you're an SE or someone in a supporting role who wants to step into a sales role, you've got to be able to have that uncomfortable conversation with yourself and yes. make that outreach work. Yep. If, if that doesn't happen, the rest of the engagement won't work. Yeah, completely. No, I'll go. It's almost like that scene in the movie where they go, sell me this pen. It's that. Cancel yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you can't do that. Yeah. And if you can't deal with that discomfort of yes. knowing that I have to do this and my livelihood and, and my earnings depend on my ability to do that. If you're yeah. uncomfortable with that, then it's not for you. And it's, and it's even in that piece of, okay, you might've seen a role advertised internally. Okay. There's a sales run. I want to put my hand up and it's actually approaching it saying, I am going to get this role and what are the roadblocks I will remove in front yep. of me to get this role? Every sales leader in the world will take that person every day and twice on Sundays. Yes. Yep. Who just removes all the roadblocks. Yes. Yep. And, and if you do that, I can teach you the rest. Of it. I can coach you. I can give you the skill and give you all the time in the world. But if you can't do that for yourself, I don't get out. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Spot yeah. on. It's an interesting so, one, Dan, because you know, I've had this conversation with a couple of SEs and they say, what's it like being a, a salesperson? And I said, are you used to rejection? And they, they don't understand what I mean. No. And so I've used the analogy. I said, imagine you're George Clooney and you're on Tinder. You've never experienced rejection. That's not what sales is about. <laughs> that's that's exactly right. Reasonable that's analogy. exactly right. You have yeah. to feel comfortable with it. It is interesting though, Simon, because what, one of the things that I've observed in my own sales leadership is... I really value the SE voice. And so even in the forecast, like when we're doing a forecast or we're doing a deal review, there, it's almost like there's a set of questions I ask the sales people in terms of qualification, decision process, timeframes, budget, et cetera. But there's equally a set of questions I'm asking the SE around how effectively have we done discovery? Have we, you know, to what extent have we validated the solution? To what extent does the customer understand the value of what we're selling? And if I can marry what the salesperson is saying with what the SE is telling me, then I feel much more comfortable about the deal. And so it's interesting as I've moved into sale, it's almost like I, I haven't let go of the SE side of me. And if anything, I think it's helped me be a, an effective sales leader. I completely agree. It's an interesting it's one because I think to your point before about the glass half empty and half full, et cetera, yeah. sales people by their nature have got happy ears, right? They're, yeah. They'll hear a tiny little thing in a conversation where a prospect will come running back and say, guess what, Dan, they're going to sign. They love our software, et cetera. And you, in that instant, you look across to the SE, yes. you just see the look in their eye and you go, to this right, comfort. I've got to do a little <laughs> bit more digging here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think salespeople need to have those happy ears. It's a tough job if you don't have that optimism. Or mm -hmm. if you don't have that, that, that gumption that you were talking about, Dan, and to get up and go like you, uh, salespeople, God bless them. They need that. I, mm -hmm. I think the, the good ones have that. And if we can balance it with the other side of the way the SE works, that's the magic, right? Yeah. That partnership yeah. and that combination, that's the magic. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that's a really good segue. I, I know that Dan, one of the, the items we wanted to talk about at the top of this as well was Moving into that kind of deal review process, whether it's live in a deal or in a deal win or a deal loss, I've been in, I've been in so many of these sessions mm. where all of a sudden it's a bunch of salespeople talking about all the positives of this deal that they won and all the things that went their way, or you're halfway through a deal and you're trying to make your way to the end, and it seems to all be a sales conversation. And I know having talked to a number of people who've worked for you over time, that's not how you bring the team together and have mm. those conversations. How do you, having lived in these two worlds, how do you approach that that you think is different to what people who just got to that, either that sales view or that SE view, 
How do you think it's different as? Yeah. Look, I, I think, I think Dan, the way it answers that is a couple of ways, actually. I think the first is I, I like to encourage the SEs to, to build what I call an SE scorecard. And what, what that is, it's a set of questions that the SEs look at in terms of, have they met the key technical buyer? Have they done the appropriate discovery? Have we got sign off on the solution? Does the customer understand our value? Do we know how we're going to integrate with all the range of disparate technology that exists? So a series of questions that the SE answers that result in a score that tells me the health of the opportunity from the SE perspective. The other thing that I've increasingly done over the years is I've actually asked SEs for a forecast. So I get them to commit a deal to me in the same way that I ask a salesperson to commit a deal. And I say, if you were the sales guy, are you committing this? Are you, do you feel like you've done enough, enough SC work to feel comfortable that this deal is going to close? And then I, and then with my sale, my, the SE managers, I then ask them for a forecast and all I'm trying to do is marry up the information I'm receiving. And, and so I think that's helped me to get a pretty accurate assessment of where the business is at, because I, I am hearing it from both perspectives and I, I'm leveraging both personalities to my advantage. So that's definitely it. The other thing I think that I, I try and do, Dan, is I always try and come back to if we're sitting here in a month's time and we've just got the call from the customer, which is, guys, I'm really sorry, but we've given the business to someone else. Why have we gotten that call today? And I really push on that it's because what that helps us to do is it helps us to imagine, okay, what are our blind spots? Where, wh what are we not thinking about? And so it's almost like a, it's almost like a loss review before you've actually lost the deal. But mm -hmm. what I'm trying to uncover is what's the risk that we're not talking about that we haven't seen yet? And how do I kind of surface that? And then ultimately what you want to drive is you want to drive a series of actions off the back of that to say, okay, let's proactively mitigate some of those things. I, I yeah, I'll definitely do that. So I use the kind of the SE in me to get back to the glass half empty kind of questions a bit to really, to make sure that we're covering all bases. Cause I think the one thing that I learned throughout my career and the Paul Applebee's of the world, Simon, to your point, taught me that is selling is as much an art as it is in science. Mm -hmm. And the science part of it is how do I get control and how do I get comfort across all of the dimensions of the sale? And I think that the good sales people are the ones that do that well. And that's what I'm always trying to manage is to wrestle control, to get to, to, to think through all of the various permutations of how this deal is going to flow. And the paranoia is, how do I get control of those things before my competitor does? And yeah, that's definitely what I've learned over the years. I think something you just mentioned in that sort of deal review process that I think almost goes all the way back to the start of this conversation, which was potential conflict between yes. AEs and SE, or just people in that team, right? It's how do you have that? And I think the deal review process is so important and critical in, in, in any sales team. But when you come to that deal review, everyone often has a very different voice than in yes. a forecast or in a review, right? And the voice becomes much more collaborative and it's, let's all look at this problem together and note the issues and note we're going to move and change. Whereas when you have that conversation between AEs and SEs and the SEs asking questions about the deal of the AE, the answer is, we haven't done a bunch of these things. I don't have a close yeah. plan yet. Yeah. No, I don't know yet who the, the actual decision maker here is. Yeah. It's on the list of shit to go and do. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to work it out, Yeah, yeah but we'll move on. Yeah. And I think it's that piece of being able to have that voice between those two people saying, hey, I see, have you been able to work out what the core problem the customer's got here? No, I don't, but I think the yeah. steps look like this from here. Okay, great. Let's organize those meetings. Let's get those answers. Let's get that engagement. Yes. Right. This is the list of all the stuff that I need to go and do. And I, I think this kind of a, leans on another thing that I think is a massive issue that needs a better name. It's closed plan is the worst name in the world mm. for the thing that sits in that drives the deal. Cause it's not about the close. It's about the, it's the decision plan or it's the, it's to get to the end of it. You yes. may never get to the end of it or the decision might be you're not the right partner. Great. Please don't buy our stuff. Mm. If you're not the right partner, please don't mm. buy it. Yep. I don't yeah. want to be in a red call for the next three years with you, like, yeah. but it's getting that piece and getting that, just what are the jobs to be done? Who's yep. going to own them? Who's going to go ahead of, ahead from here and look, work with each other to get it done. Yeah. I think it's so crucial, right? Yeah. Look, I definitely agree, Dan. I've been in deal reviews in the past as an SE where it was a really high stress, negative, 
almost like an interrogation. Like yeah. the sales leader was beating the poor account executive to almost ridicule them for everything about the deal that they didn't know. And as a, a, somebody that sat in the room for all those years, what I realized is actually the best deal reviews are where you create that safe space where different people can have a different perspective. And it's not an interrogation. It's like, mm. team, we're going to leverage each other's experience and understanding to get ourselves to a better place. And success of this deal review looks like coming up with five or six actions that we didn't have before that helps us yep. get control. That's what we're here to do. And I think as a sales leader, that's really been an interesting journey for me because when I joined HubSpot as an example, what I found is deal reviews had a very negative connotation. It was, okay, the big boss wants to interrogate you on the deal. And I also noticed that a bunch of AEs started to produce incredible sets of content, presentations and plans and stuff solely for the purpose of getting through the deal review, not because they needed it to navigate the deal. It was like, because they felt like I needed it. And so it was interesting when I said to them, guys, here's what this is not. It's not a witch hunt. I'm not here to interrogate you. I'm not here to poke holes in your deals. I'm here to help you. And everyone that's invited on this call, their main objective is to take ownership for some actions to help you be successful. That's what we're going to do. And what was fascinating is within weeks, it started to spread across the organization where all of a sudden AE started asking, I want to do a deal review with Dan because the sh there was this shift from interrogation to I'm going to help you be successful. And I, I think that's ultimately the secret here around these deal reviews is to create that safe space where we can come together and work out how we're going to move this thing forward. Ah, yeah, mutual Dan, respect on, on again. That, yeah. <laughs> exactly, Simon. It's exactly right. Exactly. On that front, Dan, I think it's, and look, we've all lived in VRP and CRM for, for our careers, but if you have to build any piece of paper in order to do a deal review, yeah, it means you don't already have the tools in place to win the deal. Yeah. You don't you have a plan. Able to, you don't have a plan. Like you, you should be able to, you should, and look, sure, there's a mental preparation piece, yeah. which I'll give you some time for, but if I walk into the morning, any salesperson should be in the scenario where for whatever reason, something happened on the call with the customer or just internally, someone more senior has suggested, I think we should all get together this afternoon and do a deal review. Yeah. You don't have all the components to be able to say to everyone, hey, head of the meeting, here's the three point things you need to know. I've shared the documents. Yep. That is what we're working from right now. If you can't do a deal review like that, then you actually need to take a step back and look at your own process and say, okay, what am I not operating with every single day that I should yes. have? to make this successful. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and normally it's a plan. You haven't got a plan. You haven't got a plan. I, I, absolutely. I actually, I actually think it's even more fundamental than that, particularly when you're selling CRM, which is if that information is not in HubSpot, then you're, you're like, how the hell are you selling this thing to customers? Like yeah. you're not even using it for the purpose it's intended. So to your point, the only thing we open up is HubSpot and we look at the deal record and that's what we used to do a deal review. There's nothing else. Right. And the good salespeople are the ones that know how to use it. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Hey guys, we're getting to the top of the hour and at the end of the session, Dan, what we do is we ask for your, we've covered a bunch of areas here, transitioning from your, your journey, people who are transitioning from SE to AE, all vice versa and, yes. and obviously deal review. But mate, out of today, look, I think the most valuable piece was your couple of top tips for probably the SE community, I think. So if you are wanting to transition or expand your career as an SE, whether you want to be an AE or not, what are the top three tips you'd, you'd leave people with? I think you've got to be clear on your motivation. As I said earlier, I, I, I fundamentally think it's got to be more than it's because of the money. I think you've got to feel comfortable that you understand what you're taking on and be motivated by that. I think it's about being comfortable with rejection and really un, like as much as you can understanding what that's going to feel like uh, beforehand. And the third thing I would say is don't be silent about it. Talk to people that have made the transition. Talk to them about make sure your manager understands your, what you want to do. You're leveraging your network as much as possible to, to the point we were talking about earlier, you've got to make it happen for yourself. So don't just sit on it, do something about it. Dan, amazing tips, mate. Thank you Great so advice. much for joining the podcast. Simon, as always, mate, thank you for your time as well. Yeah. Everyone, thank you for listening to Growth Pulse, the B2B sales podcast. If you haven't already subscribed, you're listening on either Apple or Spotify, press the plus button. If you're watching us on YouTube, click down below, press subscribe, give us a comment. Please share us on LinkedIn as well. Guys, thank you so much. We look forward to talking to you next time. Thanks, guys.